So we're here today on uh, January 13th with David McMichael to talk about his past experiences and uh, I'll leave it uh, for him to explain uh, further. So David, if you would want to just tell a little bit about what we've been discussing and how you got into the field uh, of counterinsurgency at, uh, and these other international relations issues that have arisen over the last 50 years or so. Sure. Okay, well as you've indicated, my name is David McMichael, and I am um, what you might have spent my uh, entire, almost my entire adult life in the context of the uh, Cold War, and now that has morphed into the GWOT, the Global War on Terrorism. And uh, this uh, resulted in uh, my early enlistment and graduation from high school into the United States Marine Corps, and just uh, just prior to the official end of the Second World War, and uh, uh, following uh, that enlistment, I. Uh, used the GI Bill to go to college, got my undergraduate degree, and accepted a commission in the uh, United States Marine Corps, which I intended to make a career, and uh, stayed, uh, oh, uh, there for about uh, almost eight years of uh, commission service, when for a variety of reasons I resigned uh, my commission. and. Uh, felt I'd probably, since I had a family to support, I'd better find out what people did in civilian life. So I thought I'd better go back to uh, college, and was, my timing again was excellent because the National Defense Education Act had just been passed in uh, 1958, and so I was uh, uh, made the first uh, NDEA fellow at the University of Oregon. Uh, went out to Oregon in 1959 secured, uh, went through and uh, basically secured my, uh, my doctorate there and, uh, and accepted a teaching post at a small college, Dominican College in San Rafael, California. And uh, while I was there, I was contacted by the then Stanford Research Institute, now SRI International, which had a uh, number of contracts uh, with the Defense Department, uh, <coughs> and since my specialty had been uh, uh, U.S. Uh, uh, Latin American relations, uh, I was considered something of a uh, uh, Latin American expert at the time, and had written some articles and uh, op-eds about the uh, United States intrusion, invasion, if you will, of the Dominican Republic in the mid-60s, and, uh, uh, and some other articles in military journals on uh, uh, the, uh, the sudden uh, appearance of this new uh, field called counterinsurgency, and I'd drawn on my experience while in the regular service I'd been. Uh, among other things, a graduate of the uh, Special Forces Officer School at Fort Bragg, and where I commented on the uh, fact that the uh, U.S. military planning, at least as uh, represented by the uh, then uh, Green Beret forces, was uh, that in event uh, in the Cold War context that uh, they would have the uh, same mission that the OSS had had in during the Second World War of trying to organize and uh, support uh, uprisings against, uh, uh, well in that case it had been against the German occupied uh, portions of Europe, and in this case assuming that in the Second World War uh, the United States would be fighting the then Soviet Union, which would uh, be controlling much of Eastern Europe, or perhaps more, that uh, they'd be doing the same thing. And as a matter of fact, we had been covertly doing <laughs> this a number of East European countries for, for quite a few years. But in any event, uh, uh, this, uh, by the time I had, uh, uh, you know, mid-60s, 
um, you know, gone into academia and this sort of thing. We were uh, fully embroiled in uh, Vietnam, and uh, uh, due to my background and some articles I had published and people that I knew, uh, I was offered a contract with uh, the uh, then Stanford Research Institute, uh, attached then to Stanford University, uh, to uh, uh, do uh, on contract uh, with uh, uh, the Defense Department to go to various countries in Latin America and examine the uh, state of affairs and whether there was a potential for armed action against friendly government insurgencies, if you will, that we could then, hey, counter. <laughs> it's a if we could just step back for a second, could yeah. you tell us a little bit of what you'd learned about OSS? That was the Office of Strategic Services, yeah, right? Sure. And what our experience had been, you weren't part of that in World War II, but what the Special Forces took out of it, and I, I guess the subject of guerrilla warfare. Yeah. Well, as they say, this is uh, um, the OSS experience was uh, a, a rather interesting one. It's uh, it's got a mixed history, but it was uh, uh, and there have been any number of books and articles and memoirs written about people who took part in it, but. <coughs> The idea of uh, OSS, they say, was to uh, organize, to send small teams into the occupied uh, parts of Europe, very frequently into France and into uh, Scandinavia as well. Uh, these were uh, major uh, areas of effort. Uh, and the object at the time was to, uh, uh, we were several, but uh, the main one was to uh, support and organize insurgencies which could carry out actions against the German occupying forces, uh, which could be in support of uh, later, you know, direct military operations. The, the, in history, the, the record is mixed as to how successful this was. However, it uh, became politically significant for a number of reasons. Uh, <coughs> Uh, one of them being that uh, some later extremely prominent people were uh, involved in this, these operations, uh, uh, working out of neutral Switzerland. Alan Dulles was uh, among them, and uh, working uh, uh, from London was a uh, uh, rising uh, <laughs> uh, uh, A business uh, uh, phenomenon named uh, uh, William Casey, and uh, these uh, uh, there was a lot of romance associated with this, as is almost inevitable, and uh, the <coughs> um, the as the United States for the first time, uh, as it reorganized its. Uh, uh, military forces and what is now known as its defense establishment uh, after the Second World War uh, created for the first time in American history a uh, central, uh, centralized and independent uh, national intelligence service versus the Central Intelligence Agency. I always say as a sidebar to that uh, record is that the United States had been ex in existence for uh, uh, under its constitution for 160 years before 1947, and had never lost a war. And uh, since 1947, now that we have a centralized intelligence system, we haven't won one. So <laughs> it's not it's not the best record. But in any event, uh, the inevitably the uh, this new central intelligence agency was. Uh, Staffed and drew heavily upon the, those who had, had the uh, uh, the OSS experience during during the Second World War, which means that despite the uh, original and highly publicized uh, uh, 
defense uh, or uh, rationale for creating this uh, new organization, uh, <coughs> which was supposedly going to be focused on uh, having one central area where uh, information, intelligence if you will, uh, would be gathered and which would have direct access to the decision makers and the uh, United States government. The rationale for this uh, being, of course, that we did not have a place uh, prior to uh, Pearl Harbor, prior to World War II, where this information was gathered and uh, directed toward the decision makers and this accounted for the uh, successful Japanese surprise, and of course there's a lot of historical argument about that too, but... Uh, just, just one more question going back to the OSS. So is it correct to say though when they crossed into enemy lines, German lines, mm -hmm. went into Europe, German occupied mm -hmm. territory, they weren't in uniform? Oh no. They were the, the question that you asked, it did the uh, representative of the OSS uh, wear uniform? Uh, no. They operated underground. If the, well, they were not in the U.S. military per se, the Office of Special Services. For example, uh, William Casey, who uh, uh, had uh, gotten a commerce-related post in the uh, uh, Department of State and was assigned to uh, London, the, our embassy in London, uh, <coughs> Um, worked directly uh, with uh, the uh, OSS there and his job, and which was interesting because he was hated labor unions. <laughs> his principal contacts working with him uh, in Germany were representatives of uh, German trade unions who still had their contacts in the country. And, uh, that was the main thing, but this is, no, they, they, in direct answer to your question, no. These are covert services and covert operations as defined in the uh, 1983, I believe it was, uh, 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 the Defense Appropriation Act, those actions undertaken by the United States government to influence or control uh, political, economic, or military situations in uh, a foreign country which are conducted in such a manner that the United States participation is uh, not revealed or if revealed uh, can be uh, plausibly denied. That's the, that's the key phrase, plausible denial. And the people they supported in France, they too did not wear uniforms, but fought as guerrillas, is that correct? No, no. And this is, this is a, I think you're probably far more familiar with this in, in law than I am, but uh, it's always been recognized that a, uh, when a country is occupied by a foreign military force, that the citizens of that country, the subjects of its ruler, wherever you want to define them, uh, <coughs> have... Uh, uh, something approaching a right to take up arms to uh, uh, fight against the occupying power and that uh, they do not have the protections given to uniformed and regular military services. However, it's you know, it's, it's, a, it's a gray area there in that they are exercising a right as citizen. And the question continually arises uh, when they take up arms and act as a, an armed force, do they have the uh, legal protections that uniformed armed services have? And uh, I, I, I don't think that question has been totally resolved. <laughs> But it's, it's, it's one that is, has always been there, and there's a general acceptance, I think, in the, at least in the popular mind, that uh, you know people have a right to, to do this. When Paul Revere comes riding into town, you know, I tell you that <laughs> the British are coming, do, do you have a right to grab your musket and shoot at them? 
and it'd be correct to say that the U.S. government had that view at the time because they never held this to be a violation of the law of war. In both the Gulf, first Gulf War and then the subsequent invasion of Iraq, rationale is that the government there, the which is always personalized when you don't like them. We didn't fight Germany, we fought Hitler. And we didn't fight Iraq, we fought Saddam Hussein. That's, uh, you know, the typical way it's done. But the, uh, that you needed a uh, rationale, a legally justifiable reason to conduct what was defined at the Nuremberg trials, as you know, as the ultimate uh, war crime. <laughs> it's the <laughs> opening of hostilities against another country. Is uh, that uh, since he did not, uh, you justify this that the, he had the, the weapons, you know, which he was for, you know, under anybody that he was not the weapons of so-called destruction which is, uh, you know, a rather mixed term anyway because it includes true weapons of mass destruction, which is nuclear weapons uh, and chemical weapons and biological weapons, which are, you know, not by, uh, and also uh, any missiles with a certain range, you know. Well, but WMD, weapons of mass destruction, is a handy acronym for this sort of thing. and. <clears throat> so, um, you undertake uh, a military action in this case. Now, um, when it is shown uh, that the people who undertook it, that is those decision makers in the United States and the UK particularly, and case of Iraq, when they undertook it, they knew very well that uh, the justifications they were putting forward were untrue. But we all know what the first casualty in war is. So this makes it, which is truth, and I think this makes a very interesting question for a, uh, you know, those who are uh, for, you know, various reasons, you know, r relating to the laws of war, uh, treatment of prisoners, for example, interrogation techniques, uh, confinements, and uh, identification of uh, who is a legitimate uh, target, the drone <laughs> strikes and that sort of thing, is that uh, uh, you're you go back to, and again we're, we're dealing here with the case of Iraq, you, you, and as a matter of fact you're also dealing with Afghanistan, uh, for a reason we can get into a little later, but the, uh, how do you deal with people uh, who and we've had one investigation in the United States on the, as you know, on uh, this, and two, at least two in the UK, and one, one of which is still going on, where the evidence seems to be very, uh, well, or at least there is evidence, doesn't constitute proof, I know the difference, uh, that the people making the decision to commit the ultimate war crime, that is, to open hostilities against another country, um, uh, were well aware that the reasons they were giving publicly for doing this were uh, either not true or far from uh, definitively proven. So um, are these people to be held to account? And then that takes it down to Another level, the one which we've been partially discussing here, is uh, <coughs> how do you treat those individuals 
whom you find in that country opposing your action, or if uh, uh, you take some of those people using arms to oppose you and imprison them, make them prisoners, or um, you define a whole group of people, whether they take up arms or not, uh, as your enemy if they support or in some cases do not actively oppose those who have taken up arms. Uh, they entitled to the treatment which international law, various treaties, the Geneva Convention, set up <coughs> for the treatment of prisoners of war. All right, my, look, my, my first actual involvement in these uh, sorts of activities is that uh, when I had come back from Korea and left hospital, I uh, uh, was assigned to the uh, Second Amphibious Reconnaissance Company at uh, Camp Leisure in California, Camp Leisure in North Carolina, and um, <coughs> This was the um, morphing, if you will, into the Marine Corps equivalent of uh, special forces. It's, as you know, Marine Recon, as they you know now call it. Fine. So I went trained with the uh, predecessors of the Navy SEALs, advanced underwater training, and then off to uh, the uh, special forces uh, uh, officer school at Fort Bragg. The short course I. Had I should mention it was only what 90 days something like that but the uh, <coughs> point is that the uh, direction of this uh, uh, training at the time we were in the you know really in the Cold War situation at the time was uh, <coughs> Uh, getting over a, uh, uh, a theoretical hitch here is that the uh, special forces, increasingly known as the Green Berets, were uh, deliberately designed to be the successors to the Office of Special Services. And this is a, a little bit background here is uh, if you follow this, as I have over the last half century or so, see a constant effort on the part of the uh, uh, U.S. Department of Defense, of the American military, to gain control of or maintain control of or to uh, have the, the sole control of anything that resembles uh, armed activity and specifically this has meant the long-term feud between the uh, Central Intelligence Agency which is the one could argue the linear descendant of the World War II Office of Special Services and uh, its intention to uh, do as it had done in World War II to carry out uh, and support uh, armed activities against the uh, in, in Europe at that time the, the Germans uh, and their uh, occupied areas and to continue those missions uh, elsewhere and this uh, <coughs> military has fought you know, reasonably enough against uh, you know sharing this this was uh, uh, became very apparent, of course, in Vietnam, where the, as the, which originally most of the U.S. activity there was in fact CIA directed, and uh, as our armed forces grew there, uh, uh, the U.S. military was not inclined at all to do this and in fact uh, even tried to limit you know strictly uh, non armed uh, or you know intelligence operations by the CIA this and this uh, uh, 
uh, uh, spilled over, if you will, into uh, Thailand, where I became personally involved with it. Maybe we can go back then to picking up where you said you began working for SRI? Yeah, Stanford Research. Well, I was, had, uh, after I had uh, resigned my regular commission and uh, uh, had, since I had a family to support, I <laughs> didn't know anything about civilian life, I thought I'd better uh, uh, go back to school and see what I could find. And as, as it happened, this was uh, 1959, the National Defense Education Act of 1958 had just been, or just been passed. The Russians had uh, sent their uh, satellite into space, you know, and frightened us to death that uh, we were falling behind. This is usually produces uh, some uh, legislative response, as you will know. And in this case, uh, <coughs> Uh, this was an attempt to pass out money to universities all around the, the country and uh, enable them to uh, uh, fund graduate students or set up programs which would uh, help support this, help us catch up. And uh, well, of course, the initiative for this had come because of the uh, fear of the Soviet Sputnik. Uh, in the way that government uh, programs usually work, the money was passed out with a much more lavish hand and not just focused on uh, technology. So it had happened that it, it funded me to my uh, doctorate in, in history and where I, in that case, focused specifically on uh, uh, Latin America, where I uh, had had some contacts while I was in the, in the Marine Corps, and um, so this led me because this had to focus naturally enough, with, not naturally enough, but it did on U.S. relations in the Western Hemisphere, and uh, <coughs> I got a good look at the long history of uh, United States interventions and occupations of various countries in in Latin America, focused in my case particularly on the Dominican Republic, but uh, it, it is an interesting uh, history and summarized uh, by the one-time dictator of uh, Mexico, Porfirio Diaz, who was alleged to have said, Por Mexico, so far from God, so near to the United States. So <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, we have a long history of interventions and the rationalization, rationalizations for their, uh, for their occupation and for the way in which they are conducted. Uh, I, uh, I, you know, as a former Marine, you know, I'm in some way aware of this because of their uh, part of U.S. Marine Corps history, the so-called Banana Wars, various occupations and interventions which principally U.S. Marines took in uh, uh, various countries in Latin America, most notably, of course, in uh, uh, Haiti and uh, Nicaragua. And the actions there, once again, we, we can focus again on this question that you're dealing with. You know, how legitimate is this? Okay, um, and w what, you're, what you're getting into is a matter of uh, uh, historical precedent or law, and I think there, there is a relationship between the two. Am I correct in thinking that? Yes, it goes to state practices. Yeah, okay, so. good, good. For example, Back in 1915, in the uh, <coughs> Woodrow Wilson presidency in the United States, okay, revolution ongoing in Mexico, problems arising, of course, with seizure of properties allegedly belonging to U.S. citizens and this and that, occasional border crossing in the case of Pancho Villa. Uh, <coughs> here you have an incident where, and this is where you 
the jaw tends to drop, but I could give you many further examples of this. A United States ship is uh, at the Mexican port of Veracruz. It sends a boat in to pick up supplies ashore. Okay. The uh, Mexican authorities uh, at the port said that the boat that came in did not have the proper papers and arrested the two crew members who were there and held them. Uh, there was immediate protest made and the two were immediately released. However, the commander of the United States ship that was there, on his own initiative by the way, insisted that the uh, Mexican military in, in, in Veracruz uh, not only had to return him these guys with an apology, which basically they did, sorry we arrested these guys but they didn't have the right papers and no harm meant, but they demanded that a 21-gun salute be fired. Mexican authorities for the, you know, didn't want to waste the ammunition, I guess, refused to do this. And this led to the U.S. cruiser opening fire and sending a force ashore, in the course of which uh, a handful of uh, U.S. sailors and uh, um, two or three times that number of Mexicans were killed. Now this uh, became, you know, a crisis, not a big one, but the United States government, you know, fully supported the right to do this. So, I mean, this is, these are the sort of things that have happened, uh, you know, over time. I mean, we can even in more recent times go back to the Falkland War uh, between the UK and uh, Argentina. Uh, but when you go back in, in history for this, you find once again the same situation in, back in the uh, mid-19th century when the Argentine authorities, then controlling the, uh, the Malvinas, as they call the Falkland Islands, uh, <coughs> um, um, interfered with some allegedly with some U.S. ships which were smuggling, you know, there. The United States Naval Authority, you know, pulled up there and just pulverized, you know, the place, you know, you can't do that to us. So you have this and it's, it, you know, obviously is a difference whether the country you're dealing with is, a, you know, a uh, respectable <laughs> major league player or one of these uh, the countries on the fringes, uh, but uh, these things happen. And to go back to your immediate point, uh, what is legal? You know, what controls this? Do you pay reparations to people for doing this sort of thing? Uh, the enormous amount of destruction which we in a more recent time wreaked in the 1960s in the Dominican Republic with the overthrow of the uh, Trujillo government there was uh, absolutely extraordinary. I mean, the, the lengths to which uh, the United States government, the Kennedy and Johnson administrations, uh, went to to rationalize and justify the, you know, sending of a uh, uh, couple of marine battalions and a, a U.S. Army uh, division to overthrow the elected government of the Dominican Republic. On what grounds? They were influenced, or might have been influenced, or could possibly in the future be influenced by Fidel Castro. And this was a decision made that we were going to do this, and we reached, you know, uh, while <coughs> the evacuation of, uh, uh, while the United States was, you know, using the CIA 
and its uh, military mission within the country to organize an armed opposition to the uh, then elected government. Uh, uh, the United States was evacuating its people with no problem at all, except, uh, not even except, but at one point uh, at the uh, Intercontinental Hotel in uh, Santo Domingo, where these uh, evacuations were being organized, uh, some shots were fired. One occasion, I think two or three rounds fired uh, by some ill-advised person, and this became the rationale. American citizens were in danger, and so we opened up, I forget what the operation was, uh, was called, which uh, as they sent the then government, elected government, into exile. It uh, uh, resulted in large numbers of, uh, of casualties, both military, civilian, armed opposition. The most notorious example of this was, uh, <laughs> I remember this very well, uh, most <coughs> Who fell down the stairs? I'm sorry. No, it's okay. <laughs> no, the most notorious example of this because our rationale again had to be, you know, this this point keeps coming back and back. Okay, the that the Cuban government or the communists, whichever you want to call them, some foreign governments were supporting the uh, uh, forces that it taken up arms against the uh, government that we had put into power after sending the elected government into exile, the uh, very excitedly, and this again goes back to the question of intelligence, there was a boat on the Ozama River, which is the river that flows uh, from the interior of the Dominican Republic past the uh, what had been Sierra Trujillo and was now again Santa Domingo City. Uh, it was a boat which our intelligence, you know, had found to be transporting arms to the what we now define as the rebel forces, right? Okay, we sent an airstrike in which sank the boat, yeah. killed several Dominican citizens who were on board. And to our chagrin, what we discovered is what they were transporting were uh, several cases of beer. Mm. So, as I say, once you get in, what, who is, you know, held accountable? I, to the best of my knowledge, there was no reparation made to the people who were injured or killed. We, we see this consistently in the drug war as well, as, as you well know. You're taking direct armed action, either you know, with using your own personnel or you know, giving the information to and supporting the locals who are doing this. You're going to do this. I'll give you one other very quick uh, personal story going back to my long ago days as a young enlisted Marine. Okay, when. Uh, uh, as a radio operator, and we used to carry the M1 carbine, but now that was put out of service, and so we had to be retrained in the use of the 45 pistol. And the old gunnery sergeant who was uh, giving us our instruction. Now, we're talking here in the 1940s, so it's a long time ago. But he had been one of the U.S. Marines in our occupation of the uh, Agua. And he was describing uh, that they knew, as he telling war stories here, that they knew that one of the uh, Nicaraguan workers at their base, or they suspected strongly that he was spying for uh, Sandino, the leader of the uh, armed opposition to the U.S. occupation. So when showing us how to, you know, practice taking aim, you see, he said, "Well, that was he was a." part of the Marine Corps uh, pistol team down there, so that he, you know, every day went and snapped in, as they say, you know, took in his arm, 
So uh, with the wink and nod authorization of his commander, uh, he was doing this when the, uh, the alleged uh, Sandino spy walked across the field and, God damn, shot him and killed him. Got him, got rid of him, but that's, what you, that's the way you had to aim it, right? So, w what I'm saying is these kinds of, whether we're being anecdotal here or relying on historical record or testimony of something else, is once you put your armed forces in these places, uh, you know, it's inevitable that you have what appear to be violations of, you know, international law, Geneva Convention, or, you know, common common practice, and so that, uh, uh, and again, this is also extends to um, uh, the way you handle people who are suspected of participating in the uh, uh, resistance to your operation, and, and it's, you know, it's a consistent pattern. So uh, what's happening at uh, Guantanamo, what's happening at uh, Bagram, what's happening in these uh, rendition sites is not surprising. And this is further complicated, I would argue, when you are dealing with uh, non, uh, well, just to put it this way, non-European uh, individuals. They are not, we know from our own experience in the days of the Filipino insurrection, which continually comes up in the discussion of waterboarding, what you do with slopes and googlies and uh, gooks. You know, it's it's, it's different because they are different, and you're you're going to get this this sort of treatment. So, uh, you're dealing with a cultural aspect of of this as well. My belief. You want to go back to how I got, you know, involved more directly in this. So they say, um, I was, as we were building up our operations in Vietnam, I was contacted uh, by uh, the Stanford Research Institute, first hired largely because of my Latin American uh, studies background to take part in a Defense Department study in uh, uh, Central America and also down in Peru and Colombia on uh, the extent and development of uh, uh, communist or communist related or East Bloc supported or we don't like you uh, uh, operations, you know, in, in these countries. Could, could they become the next Cuba? I mean, post Bay of Pigs, I mean, uh, the, the panic was, uh, was on, you know, this couldn't happen again. And so uh, I made reports on these uh, countries, quite favorably received. One was read into the congressional record, I think. But the, uh, 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 as I mentioned earlier, the the struggle between the uh, CIA and the U.S. military had uh, uh, resulted in the uh, CIA being effectively cut out of its. Uh, operations in Vietnam, and at that time we had a, a huge and growing presence in uh, Thailand, which is where most of the air bases from which we carried out operations in uh, Vietnam were, were conducted. And uh, uh, one result of that was the fact that the, uh, the, the head of the U.S. military operation there uh, and uh, the uh, CIA station chief, 
a guy named Red Jansen, by the way, uh, were hardly on speaking terms. And the then U.S. ambassador um, and the State Department made a, one of these tough decisions. Well, okay, uh, if they couldn't decide to whom to assign these operations, they'd bring in a new office altogether, and, uh, which would be, in this case, headed by a very senior CIA officer. And uh, uh, it would be specifically to deal with not the situation of uh, the U.S. bases in the country or anything else, but uh, strictly to uh, uh, doing intelligence related to uh, uh, countering these insurgencies, which it was believed were developing in various parts of the country. Uh, the guy who was selected to head this uh, happened to be from San Francisco originally, a uh, very senior CIA officer, formerly station chief in Saigon, by the way. He was the guy who was blown up in the, that uh, event. I don't know the hell it was. Uh, in the, uh, oh, early on, 61 or two thereabouts, a bomb had been set off in front of the U.S. Embassy. And, damn near killed him, but uh, in any case, he'd gone back on uh, active duty. His name was Pierre de Silva. He wrote a book called Sub Rosa, which is interesting. But uh, his, uh, because there was so much opposition both in the CIA and from the, in the military mission there to bringing in this third force, as it were, uh, he was only allowed to bring a secretary, a personal assistant, and I think one other person with him, and would have to pick up the rest of his staff from people who were on in country. Okay, well, the, I had already joined the uh, uh, SRI office there, uh, which was doing something <laughs> I forget. But but in any case, De Silva wondering what to do when he stopped by in uh, the San Francisco area, which was his home area, and he stopped to see one of my colleagues, who formerly a senior CIA officer, had been himself, and he mentioned this problem of his, and my colleague said, well, uh, if you just don't want people who are already there, said, Dave McMichael is there, so I was taken away from that mission and put in De Silva's office in the U.S. Embassy, and that's where I spent most of my time at the Special Assistant for Counterinsurgency. And uh, so it was, uh, as you say, just becoming increasingly a, uh, uh, a concern. I don't think the problem was as serious in uh, Thailand as people thought. But again, you had, and this is one of the things that intrigued me, uh, the constant, and I've seen it there most personally, but I've seen it elsewhere as well, uh, you know, a struggle between various branches in the uh, U.S. Uh, military slash security situation uh, uh, trying to control things. And in this case, a more to me, most interesting applications of this was that um, <coughs> as I said, the uh, one of the major concerns was this huge uh, uh, number of U.S. controlled air bases and how are we going to make the security of these, you know, and the Air Force particularly and its uh, intelligence system was really moving hard. They wanted to, you know, develop their own network of informants in the areas, you know, around these bases. The U.S. policy was that at these bases, and this was strongly held by the Thai government, for its own reasons, 
said, no, you have to, you cannot, you know, organize your own intelligence here. You have to stay on your base and we'll give you the information which you need. So uh, uh, this got to the point where a uh, interagency task force was set up, of which I was designated a member, to deal with this question. And as it turned out, I wrote the final report for this thing, which was basically said, you know, keep them on the base and we can use these other systems that are out there. And, uh, but uh, they say the both, neither the uh, CIA nor the military liked that. We had another situation down an area where I worked a lot, which was along the Thailand border. Um, uh, the, which was an area where there really was an insurgency and one that's still going on today, as I think you know, where a Muslim population in the southern part of Thailand uh, has long-standing grievances against the uh, local governments imposed, imposed upon them by the Buddhist government in, uh, in Bangkok, so they run around and shoot each other and carry on and do stupid things. But uh, it was finally agreed that uh, U.S. Special Forces could uh, go in the area and assist in the training of the joint Thai-Malaysian forces that were operating there, but they had to keep it very low level. So, okay, the Special Forces guys went down, and uh, so after a while we didn't hear anything from them, and. Uh, I was told by my boss to go down there and see what was happening. And what do I find when I go to this totally, uh, basically, uh, Chinese village, Kok Po, down there, which has been a center of uh, armed activity for years, is to find that this young Special Forces captain and his six-member group, keeping themselves, you know, totally anonymous, had moved into one of the buildings in the center of town, raised an American flag over it. <laughs> We're going on. And I, I, I went to see the guy. I said, geez, you know, this, what, this kind of goes against what your instructions are. I said, I said, so I, why are you advertising? He said, well, he says, we're special forces. We don't skulk around. We let people know we're here. I said, well, stop it right now. <laughs> but again, the, the point to be made is once you intrude into a situation like that, you're going to find repeated instances of, uh, well, in one sense stupidity, but in another sense it's, uh, it's trying to magnify your own role. and. Uh, this is going back to this question of the uh, the air bases and the security there. Interviewing over and over again the uh, you know the Air Force intelligence people that were there, you're dealing with I can say now young, but I'm they were young even to me then. They guys in their twenties, young captains, young majors. They were trained in intelligence, right? which carries a special aura around it, and they wanted to get out there and do exciting things. And when you told them that's not the policy, they are not happy, and that is why a lot of these uh, uh, incidents take place, is you, you've got people who are, you know, quote unquote, wanting to see action, and this happens inevitably when you put arm people on the ground in exotic environments, and as I'm just saying this on the basis of, you know, some limited participation and observation and a good deal of reading on the subject, you find this repetition of these sorts of activities going on and on. And when these actions, uh, you know, seem to cross the line between Geneva Convention or international law recognized uh, permissible activities, you find 
a situation which I think you've been dealing with a lot in this is you have a a need, if you will, an institutional need in the organizations involved to protect and defend your people. You can't be seen as letting them down. And that's, uh, at least from my very second-hand reading of the sort of things that have been going on uh, around the situation at Magram, Guantanamo, and so forth, is, uh, in my opinion, precisely that. This effort, uh, you know, we're, we're talking about suppressing guerrilla movements, insurgent movements, rebellions, whatever you want to call them, and the Peruvian case in the 1980s and 90s with the rise of this, uh, I would say, rather bizarre and extreme group, sort of a Western Hemisphere version of the Khmer Rouge, the Sendero Luminoso. In, uh, in Peru, uh, it has a very unjust, uh, by my standards, uh, social and political system. So, but this uh, very violent group uh, broke up with organizing peasants in the back country and so forth. And the measures used to put it down were, in fact, extreme. And I, I quoted one. Uh, senior government official who was presented with an estimate that uh, for every three Sendero Luminoso uh, insurgents, guerrillas, re rebels, whatever you call them, were killed, probably 60 uh, people who were merely living in the area were also killed. He says, I think that ratio is about correct. We can, we can handle that. And I was in Peru you know, during that time and talking to people, and there were many people, you know, in uh, the cities, Lima and elsewhere, who were scared to death of this and, you know, shared this thing. But you're also coming off a long history of, uh, in which the dominant uh, Europeanized or Americanized or, for lack of a better term, white uh, population in these ethnically mixed countries, uh, you know, are both terribly afraid of and also willing to take extreme measures against the native ethnic populations, Indios. And so that's what's done. Uh, to an extent, we did the same thing in the United States with this. With, with this. So, so it, it, is, uh, it is a factor in almost all of these. Uh, because, and I think this goes to uh, the work you're doing. Uh, yeah, you, you're right, but the law doesn't apply to these people. Right. So uh, that is, these, these are experiences you know from history happen, and you can anticipate that <coughs> sim under similar circumstances, if you engage in this in the future, you're going to do the same thing and make the same rationalization, rationalizations and excuses for doing it. You're, you're aware of the Phoenix program. Do you see this? And, and then, of course, the uh, Latin American counterinsurgencies, what often called the dirty wars in the 1980s, mm -hmm. and, and obviously Peru would be part of that. Mm -hmm. So do you see that too often, perhaps? Uh, we've adopted that as a counterinsurgency method to... Yeah, I think the Phoenix program was oh, all yeah. about taking look, out the so-called infrastructure. One, one of the reasons uh, you find uh, demonstrators, uh, frequently led by the uh, uh, priest Roy Bourgeois, uh, demonstrating at uh, the headquarters of the uh, what used to be uh, the Americom, you know, training center for in S Panama, school. which has been moved up here to Fort Benning, I think. It's, uh, school okay. of the Americas now. Yeah, yeah, not not called no. the School of the Americas now. It's the inner uh, yeah. hemispheric whatever system. Okay, and uh, which has from its very beginning, you know, persistently declared that uh, 
one of the reasons for the training and indoctrination of the military leaders of uh, various dictator-led or military-controlled uh, countries in the Western Hemisphere is to inculcate, uh, uh, you know, respectable standards for the conduct of uh, operations in these groups. Yet the same groups carry out the most atrocious and have over the past 25, 30 years, the most atrocious uh, uh, operations. Colombia continues to be an example of this. Um, no matter what one thinks about the uh, the opposition there, but this, uh, as I say, the, this this happens persistently, and it does involve, and this has been shown over and over again, you know, Guatemala and El Salvador, uh, uh, particularly in Dominican Republic and. That the uh, military or uh, quasi military CIA forces operating for the United States, uh, they will support and uh, not take serious action against our. Uh, allies, if you will, who carry out the most extraordinary violations of, uh, of both their own domestic law, international law in general. There's no, there's no apology for it. You, over and over again, you, you can meet with the people, I have, uh, in these military missions, and, in, uh, they, and they will, you know, far from, my view, far from, uh, attempting to restrain their counterparts, they come to identify with them. You know, these are these are our guys. You know, I go out to the club with them, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> and so uh, I'm not going to, you know, rescind. Of course, you're uh, in the same situation that uh, almost any. Uh, person, whether it's the United States or not, which maintains a mission in a foreign country, is, yeah, you might not identify with the practices carried out by the government of that country. It may be the policy of your government, in this case the United States government, to uh, uh, oppose these sorts of things, and you will, you know, write the appropriate uh, uh, memoranda back to the State Department and the cable back explaining that you met with the Minister of the Interior and expressed concern about this and he should, uh, you know, cool it, so forth. But if you're going to work in that country, you can't, you know, just face up to the guy and say, hey, you know, you can't do this. It's fine. Here's your, here's your papers. Go home. You, we left off a little earlier uh, talking about Thailand mm -hmm. and your, the job you did in Thailand. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, what did you do after you left Thailand? You'd worked for the CIA in Thailand then. Well, I didn't work quote unquote for the CIA. I technically I was on a contract with the uh, uh, U.S. Department of Defense, through Stanford Research Institute, and uh, Mr. De Silva, uh, the who was sent to head this uh, uh, special assistant for counterinsurgency affair on a recommendation of a colleague of mine, you know, uh, arranged to have me removed from the main project and simply go to work in the, in the U.S. Embassy there. And we weren't part of the CIA station, it was made quite clear. And uh, so we operated, it was kind of interesting too because it was, uh, uh, you know, there were occasions when I as a you know, a non-government uh, officer found myself, you know, serving as the buffer between uh, the CIA station, the U.S. military mission, and the embassy's political office. And I sat uh, every, uh, uh, once a week, we had like every place had a Tuesday meeting, you know, with the representatives from all the uh, 
various agencies in the country, so I didn't sit at the table. I sat one sit back to lean over to the table until to Silva what he might or might not want to say. But uh, you know, it was uh, it was an up close experience. When I when I left and came back to the U.S., uh, I uh, found an opportunity to get out of the uh, security related uh, operations and went to work for another branch in uh, in SRI, carrying out long range futures studies. It was uh, it was okay, and then uh, I had a is in contract research, you know, you just bring in the contract or you're out the door. And I thought I had this uh, study, the National Science Foundation had all but assured me they were going to get behind it and do it. And I still think it would have been an important study it was on uh, the political, economic, social consequences of the uh, you know, aging of the American population, something which <laughs> policy issues. They, but in any case, they didn't. And uh, uh, so, I'd been there for about a dozen years, and I, they told me that I'd better look for something else to do. And I, they say I went into that. I'll repeat the phrase. I love it. The genteel form of unemployment, known as private uh, consulting, and. Uh, as it happened, I had come back to Washington to uh, do a contract for one of my clients, and uh, when that was over, I uh, was here in Washington and uh, uh, notified by a friend who was uh, still working in the agency, saying that uh, you know, with this stuff I'd been doing in long-range futures and so forth, that there had just uh, uh, opened a uh, new, not new office, but established a, you know, a, a project within the uh, CIA uh, where they would bring in uh, people with uh, good backgrounds and you know new ways of thinking to uh, uh, work in an office that had been established to prepare. The national intelligence estimates of which you hear so much, and uh, so uh, as it happened, I said, "Well, that sounds interesting." And I was out on a run, uh, going across a golf course up uh, in uh, you know somewhere uh, in Fairfax County, and uh, I spotted on the golf course one of my former colleagues from uh, Thailand out there playing golf. And I said, oh, hi, Les. And I said, do you still go in? He was retired then. Does he still go in the building? He says, yeah. I said, well, I've heard about this. And he said, can you check it out for me? I said, oh, fine. So uh, uh, he uh, called me up a day or two later. He said, yeah, here's the guy to see. Made an appointment, went in, and then checked me out and uh, hired me for this uh, this uh, office. One of the reasons this was done is that preparing these uh, in national intelligence estimates sometimes gets to be a fairly lengthy thing, and the the various you know branch offices in the you know or the company you know focused offices in the agency are frequently reluctant to let go of their you know top people, best qualified people to be. Away from them for three, the three, four months. Sometimes it takes to do this, and so I thought, well, they bring in some people from outside, and uh, so uh, I was brought in, and it was a very uh, good working relationship for uh, several years. But my focus again was back on Latin America. And this is the early 1980s, and what we're talking about is uh, the big focus is the Contra War, all right? It's being justified, of course, by this shipment of arms to the Salvadoran insurgents by the uh, uh, leftist elected, well, not elected, but the government of 
Nicaragua that had overthrown uh, the Somoza government there. Something that uh, great embarrassment to the CIA, I can tell you, is their, their last report before Somoza fled into exile was he's solid. <laughs> 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 so, but in any event, uh, you mean the CIA has been wrong on at least one occasion from time to time. Okay, but they make the least untruthful statements they can make when they do when they are. So anyway, uh, uh, long short of it is that uh, I was focused as necessary on this conflict, and I I'm pretty. My academic training and experience in, in the field tells me look hard both for the evidence and at the evidence. And we could not come up with evidence you would take into traffic court that would, uh, you know, support these claims of these shipments of weapons, which was the rationale for our training and financing and arming the so called Contra. Rebels, which were basically the old uh, uh, Guardia Nacional of, uh, of uh, Nicaragua. So, you know, it uh, led to any number of confrontations and some difficulties for uh, uh, my boss, a very nice man, now deceased, Harold Ford. Hal Ford, who uh, had the uh, uh, very, to me, uh, very <laughs> interesting experience of uh, having, after the the uh, revelations of the 1970s, with the investigating commissions, he had been made the first uh, uh, CIA officer assigned to uh, report directly to the Congress. He was their congressional liaison office, and what. The reason I raise this is when, uh, some years later, when my opposition on this uh, Contra thing had led to the point where Hal had to come to me and say, we can't keep you on here because, you know, you're, you're making too much trouble for people because of what you, you won't support the program. And I said, fine. Uh, but when I did leave, and uh, because I felt at that point okay, I tried, you know, to raise the concerns inside the system. And um, my, I know I'm right. I believe I'm right. <laughs> and my uh, reward is I'm being sent out. And I said, cause as I told you earlier, I did get a little consolation prize with this. Uh, independent contract to do this uh, uh, broad, wide-ranging study on Columbia, which was uh, supported me for quite a while. But I said, okay, I'm going. I feel I believe I have to go public with this. I uh, contacted some uh, lawyers, uh, Ramsey Clark being one of them, and explain what I wanted to do, and I, so I realized I was bound by my obligation not to real classified information. And I said, what my argument is going to be, I am stating that the administration is supporting uh, on claims that it has this evidence, and I'm going to say they don't have the evidence. I am not going to reveal anything. I'm just going to challenge the administration if they've got it, reveal it. And my statement is, I'm not revealing classified information. I'm just saying there's no classified information here to reveal. That's why I made mm -hmm. a statement. And uh, you know, it, it worked out for me. It, it did uh, me because I never. I, I'm sure I have a FBI file on me, but I, I've never bothered to ask for. But uh, I. You know, after you know, some minor clashes handled through my attorneys, I would never faced any threat of prosecution. But nevertheless, Hal Ford, I mentioned as my boss, had made himself so popular with the members of Congress and is serving in this liaison function. I was 
told my uh, contract, I'd been brought in not as a regular CIA officer, but attached to the CIA under contract with a, uh, uh, a, a grade of uh, civil service grade 14.8, just under, you know, the GS-15, which is your highest level. <coughs> so, um, the, uh, as I mentioned, this Ford was very popular, and the reason his name immediately pops into mind was at that time when uh, Robert Gates was first nominated to be director of the CIA back in, uh, when was it, 1989, thereabouts? I guess so. Um, it was the most extraordinary uh, Senate hearing on his confirmation at which appeared the well-regarded Harold Ford, Al Ford, who testified for the better part of three hours that uh, he would not give Robert Gates that job or any other job. He was completely untrustworthy and dishonest. This was followed by the further testimony of Melvin Goodman, whom you may or may not have met, Mel, and uh, who had been Gates's first supervisor in the CIA, who gave the same testimony. This did not affect the, uh, the committee, of course, which uh, went on to uh, make him director of the CIA, and then passed on, of course, to become the uh, president of Texas A&M University, and rather successful career, but the, the testimony was absolutely astonishing. But in, we were getting back as to what I did at, after the time I left. I identified, became, you know, held, was given the benefit of a very good uh, press conference uh, hosted by the New York Times um, branch chief here in, in D.C. and was then, you know, uh, in the papers and um, went about uh, working with different groups and uh, speaking and against this policy, particularly in Nicaragua. Went back to Nicaragua, did a lot of traveling, talking to people and so forth. And so if I can just interrupt for one second. For, so to be clear then, while you've talked a little bit about our United States government's counterinsurgency program, the Contras, they would have been insurgents that we were supporting. That's correct. So and we did that. This was, again, very interesting, the way in which we did this. We, of course, denied we were doing it. There's a, you know, this is, a, we, we mentioned the definition of covert operations earlier you know, where we say that we undertake these actions uh, and conceal them, but if revealed, we can plausibly deny them. Well, we kept denying this, but it, of course, was very implausible. And the, this war against Nicaragua ran on for the better part of 10 years. Many thousands of people killed, tremendous cost, and wound up in the, uh, uh, that the Nicaraguan government uh, uh, filed a case against the United States in a world court at The Hague, to which I was called as a witness. The, uh, the verdict ran, uh, I think there were 12 judges on the court, and it was uh, 9 to 3 uh, against the United States with the U.S. judge a member of the court who, strangely enough, did not uh, recuse himself in this case. Mm. <laughs> and I think the Japanese uh, representative also voted for the United States. But in any event, the, uh, 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 this led to the next stage in which uh, damages were sought, which were estimated at about $16 billion. And uh, uh, in the following elections in uh, Nicaragua in the uh, late 80s, the uh, opposition candidate won, I would say largely on the, uh, uh, because the United States made it very clear that the, if 
the opposition candidate did not win, we were going to continue the this, you know, painful and destructive war. There were some other aspects to it, but in any case, the uh, in a textbook example here, we had the, an election and the the opposition party won. The supposedly dictatorial Sandinistas tipped their hats and left power and are, are back in again, or at least Daniel Ortega is. But uh, but that's uh, that's what I devoted myself uh, to for a lot of time. I helped, you know, wrote articles, uh, traveled around speaking, and uh, um, during the same period uh, I helped organize a group of uh, former CIA officers, the, uh, uh, which uh, Dan Ellsberg, who was not an ex-CIA officer, but the uh, 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 Association of uh, uh, Intelligence Professionals, uh, and published their magazine, uh, Unclassified, here in Washington. We've dealt with uh, these matters and focused heavily on it, and uh, you know, and the the high point of that, I guess, uh, over the years was uh, when I was contacted by a group of uh, former Russian intelligence officers. Uh, the Cold War over, right? And so they invited me over to Moscow. And I spoke over there and then made arrangements to bring a dele their delegation over here and took them on a countrywide tour, you know, saying, okay, Cold War over, uh, what, what are we going to do with these intelligence organizations, covert operations, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, then, you know, after that, a lot of, uh, you know, they say Cold War was over. And so the uh, funding I'd been receiving from various interest groups uh, petered out, and I thought, well, I'm now 66 years old. I think I should retire, which I did, and used the first year of my retirement to take a nice long walk across the United States from Drake's Point back to Washington, D.C. Very interesting. and. Uh, Not long after that move, uh, you know, moved out here, and uh, of course I was uh, had mistaken things entirely because the by the beginning of the this century the flags were all up again, and a new group was being formed called Veteran Intelligence Professionals for Sanity, which contacted me, headed by Ray, well, not headed by really, but he's the most visible face of it, Ray, Raymond McGovern, Raymond McGovern. And uh, so I've been working with them ever since, dealing with uh, basically the same issues. And uh, we're not having any more success, I think, than, than we did earlier, but at least it keeps, uh, we have a means of, uh, you know, joining in the discussion and keeping the discussion going. But I'll get back to the the main point here is my focus uh, in that latter part of my uh, career in dealing with the Contra war particularly and things everything you know that uh, has been happening in the Middle East been happening there the United Nations, did a uh, intensive investigation uh, in the uh, early 90s after the peace process in uh, Central America had over much United States opposition actually gone forward and uh, restored a laying down of arms and you know listed a tremendous you know the, there are atrocities on all sides but in El Salvador particularly they pointed out the vast majority of them occurred, you know, by organizations that were 
uh, funded by, directed by, assisted by the United States, and in the process, um, more than one, you know, United States citizen was killed, as we all recall. Uh, issue early in the Reagan administration where a group of uh, American citizen nuns uh, were ambushed by the Salvadoran National Guard and uh, three of these women were killed. And the complaints were raised, but the U.S. Uh, ambassador to the United States at the time, uh, is Jean Kirkpatrick, now deceased, uh, loudly proclaimed that uh, was they they weren't nuns; they were radicals. So that's why they got themselves killed. And this sort of thing happened with great frequency in El Salvador, just as it was happening, uh, you know, in uh, in Nicaragua. But the fact of the matter was, and this was at, at that period when I was, you know operating within the agency and able to examine the correspondence and so forth. And, and uh, the involvement with, uh, despite the proclamations of, you know, we're helping out, but we're again at that situation where the, uh, your advisors, if you will, the people who are in there tend in, I shouldn't say inevitably, but with great frequency to identify with uh, the forces they are assisting. I still remember a cable that I was uh, uh, read in which the head of the uh, U.S. Uh, 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 military assistance mission in Guatemala is flying with a uh, he's sitting in the co-pilot seat with the uh, Guatemalan Air Force plane, which is attacking uh, one of the insurgent groups, peasant groups, whatever you want to call them. And uh, he is uh, recorded as, uh, you know, shouting excitedly as the strafing begins, Dales, Dales, give it to them, give it to them. <laughs> so it's hard to, uh, this, oh, this is a point I'm making, it is hard on the basis of my arguably limited experience with this, for those people who make up the advisory missions with these groups, whether they be in the intelligence system, whether they be, you know, directly military or not, not to uh, identify with, to support, to excuse, even directly to assist actions which are, you know, demonstrably in violation of what I believe are the laws of war, or in many cases, uh, you know, simply uh, decent human practice. But they do, and these these wars get, you know, extremely personal and violent, and they're highly politicized, of course, and you know, these are very small countries, you know, a lot of people know others, and you have the experience of the dirty war in Argentina, the same thing in Uruguay, which, by the way, you, the, I will raise the name of Philip Agee, now deceased himself, a dedicated uh, uh, CIA officer, you know, strong Catholic anti-communist background, goes in the agency, becomes the operations officer in Latin America. He's in Uruguay. He's goes with his station chief to visit the Minister of Interior in uh, Montevideo on some matter. The Interior Minister's office is in the same building where the prison in which, you know, the, the tortures and so forth are, are being carried out. And you can hear the screams going on in the office. And Phil, when he, he leaves with his boss, he says, you know, this is this is terrible. What are we going to do about this? I said, pay no attention to it. Don't report on it. That's when Phil began to turn, and uh, you know. But it's once again I raise this uh, 
simply to point out that we have a very long and consistent history of uh, in these conflicts, be they covert or overt or uh, large scale or small scale, in which the the violations occur, and it is difficult, in my experience, to find instances where the representatives of the United States government, be they military, be they intelligence, be they diplomatic, uh, make effective or consistent stands against this. They will announce, of course, that it's not United States policy to involved in this and that, but the on-the-ground experience, as I've seen it, uh, you know, let's say close-up phase two, uh, or have followed it through official traffic, is uh, not one that could lead you to believe that uh, in these sorts of conflicts that the United States adheres strictly to itself, uh, the what I believe are laws of war or international law or whatever, uh, nor does the United States uh, use the pressures it could, I think, financial, military, and others uh, on the government which it is supporting when it consistently uh, commits these violations, even in cases, by the way, and we can raise the name of Jennifer Harbury and, uh, you know, in Guatemala, among others, uh, even in cases where this, and the, the nuns in El Salvador I've already mentioned, even in these cases where United States citizens, you know, are, you know, directly and sometimes fatally harmed. It's, uh, it's, 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 as I say, once again, we're dealing, and the reason you're talking to me is because you want me to speak from my experience or my memory of my experience or my own prejudices or however you want to <coughs> feel it, is that there is, that once you get involved in these types of conflicts, you know, whether in a support mode, as we've been talking about in uh, Latin America, <coughs> or directly, as in uh, Vietnam, just Phoenix, My Lai, whatever you want to say, <coughs> have a, no, excuse me, a, a, you know, a consistent record of vi both of violations of what appear to be law, what is said to be policy, and uh, on the other side of that, and again, we look at uh, My Lai, Lieutenant Cali, and, and there's many other instances of this, as you know, in, in Vietnam, where individuals, you know, carry out these serious violations of law and uh, they either are punished or punished very lightly. We're seeing the same things arising in uh, Afghanistan and Iraq, and uh, and we've talked about some of the reasons for this. Of course, and you're if you're a commander of a unit and your guy has uh, done something, and uh, first of all, you don't want to take responsibility for it yourself. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're, you're going to uh, come up with all sorts of uh, arguments about the ex extraordinary circumstances in which the incident occurred, and, um, and you're going to get your, your people off the hook if you can. So I don't, I don't think that that's uh, unusual in uh, the history of any country. I think one of the uh, examples which has come up from time to time due to this weapons of mass destruction thing is uh, you find that uh, 
um, post World War One, Winston Churchill, you know, directly authorized the use of poison gas in Iraq against the tribes people that were opposing the solution put forward by uh, the you know the Western Allies with the breakup of the Turkish Empire. He said these are you know it expresses it you know quite well you know these are savages and uh, they don't deserve any better and if I can you know uh, use this weapon and not risk the lives of uh, you know British soldiers in, in doing this that's what we do I'm paraphrasing of course right. but uh, this is uh, this is not unusual and it is and I'm going to re-emphasize this as a point one can make it is a nearly inevitable consequence of, you know, engaging in, first of all, in any type of warfare. And where it is uh, covert, you know, it uh, typically is worse because covert means you've got something to hide. And uh, so I, I'm not, as I say, I don't. I have to really, uh, you know, in thinking about this, say, okay, if, uh, you know, the, these violations of laws of war, whether it be at, uh, on the field itself or in the prison, Bagram or uh, Guantanamo, uh, who you know, is going to be held criminally liable if, in fact, this goes toward a, a criminal case type resolution. So, your point about Churchill and poison gas on the Iraqis sounds like something like what people are saying today about the use of drone warfare, drones on uh, various people in the Middle East. Uh, you know, same sort of attitude that they're outside the law or mm -hmm. any similarities that you see there. Oh, I, I definitely see the similarities. I mean, when you're you're dealing with, uh, and this is always a, uh, you know, at least for the this whole period of uh, Western European United States dominance and the age of imperialism and so forth, your uh, your justification is uh, whether we did it in the Philippines or. Uh, Whatever we the crap we carried out in the, during the occupations in the twenties of uh, Haiti and Nicaragua, you know. I mean uh, that's basically the response. I mean, here's the idealist Woodrow Wilson who authorized both of those, you know, invasions and occupations. Is a man who believed very firmly, South Carolinian by birth, you know, believed very firmly that what he then called colored people, black people, did not have a capacity for self-governance and should not be allowed it. I mean, that was just a, a, a way that he believed. And uh, so, and it was no consequence that at the same time as President of the United States, after he took office in uh, 1913, in all government uh, uh, situations in Washington, D.C., he reintroduced racial segregation, which had not been enforced there since the end of the Civil War. It's, I, he made it very clear that it, it was unreasonable to expect, uh, for example, that uh, women, uh, uh, white women postal employees would be required to work in the same space as a black man. Or black anybody. I mean, but this is these are the things that more than I think most historians or most observers uh, want to acknowledge that govern a lot of the policy. This is why it's okay to waterboard those Filipinos a hundred years ago, and why it's perfectly okay to waterboard uh, some Arab, some raghead, whatever you want to call them in uh, the 21st century. 
you, uh, in regard to Milai, you said, I think you said, uh, just to clarify, you said that too often people doing things such as that are either not punished or punished very lightly. Is yeah. that what you said? Yeah. yeah. And then... That's Lou, Lou, the officer in charge there, the Lieutenant Kelly. Right. As you know, received a six-year sentence. Uh, he was the, uh, subsequently uh, allowed to serve it out under uh, a very limited form of house arrest in his hometown and run a reasonably successful jewelry business while he was doing it. <laughs> and then another question, you mentioned the American uh, flying in Guatemala with the Guatemalans who were attacking some people. Yeah, and this was, this people. was uh, I forget his name, he was the colonel, he was the uh, head of the U.S. military advisory group there. And he was so excited, you know, that he was up there actually seeing this. And he, that, that's the phrase I remember in the cable, dales, dales, give it to him, give it to him. Is it reasonable to believe that uh, some, of the atro as some of the atrocities in Guatemala were regarding killing civilians, that uh, some of the people might have, who were under attack might have been civilians in this, you know, villagers or whatever? It's, inevi or? it's, it's inevitable. Do you remember the CIA manual that uh, allegedly was disseminated? To the Contras, mm -hmm. talks about assassination, I believe. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, yes, I, I do recall that, but uh, you know, I, I not enough of this. It was it was used, and I, I think the evidence was uh, fairly clear, uh, demonstrating that uh, the United States government, through the through the CIA, was endorsing and uh, instructing in the conduct of illegal uh, activities. Yeah. And then uh, you, uh, you'd you actually referred me to a documentary, so I'm putting in a plug for it, Panama Deception. Mm -hmm. uh, anything to uh, say about that in regard to uh, President Bush at the time, H.W. Uh, Bush, and uh, anything else to add about Robert Gates in that relationship? No, I can't. I can't think so. It was... Uh, yeah, it was it was a complicated situation, and well, they always are complicated situations in Panama. But uh, we had, you know, employed these services uh, in various ways of uh, then head of state Manuel Noriega, president in uh, Panama, and there was a. Uh, Strong movement that uh, the, the film is very good, by the way. It deserved its Academy Award. The, uh, uh, the very strong movement to uh, uh, get rid of him, as, uh, which uh, again, in, in any one of these instances, you know, we're, whether we're talking about, uh, you know, mentioning again the Dominican Republic before, what was that Operation Fast Track or whatever the hell they call it. Uh, uh, that uh, you know that led to the American invasion and occupation in uh, when was it 64 uh, the the all you have to do is go back in what's available in the diplomatic traffic to see expressed over and over again well uh, you know obviously this is a bad guy he's very unpopular and he's uh, likely to be overthrown and uh, we wouldn't be happy to see him go, but we have to make sure that this doesn't bring in another Castro. And the, the term is used over and over again. This was uh, so, uh, this, it was just such a, <coughs> excuse me, Out and out fear, and the way this was handled in Panama. Again, the uh, uh, there was uh, a well-established uh, move to get rid of Noriega by the Panamanian military itself, and for uh, uh, by assassination, by the way. But uh, the commander of the United States forces in Panama uh, refused to block the road, you know, which would have allowed this to 
go forward and you know and eventually wound up in a situation where the um, United States carried out this uh, invasion which was you know extremely brutally done you know, massive use of airstrikes on a, you know a densely populated neighborhood which had the unfortunate uh, uh, situation of being located around the Panamanian Defense Ministry <laughs> building, you know, and we've never really reported accurately on the number of, of p people who were killed. In this case, uh, were they civilians? Were they not? There wasn't much, uh, you know, uh, overt armed uh, opposition, but the forces that were brought in, you know, just, you know, if it's moving the wrong way, let them have it. And they, and it's easy to do when we've had this. I'll raise this point too because it's, uh, I think, uh, not necessarily entirely valid. It might not even be entirely uh, true. But the official studies uh, after World War II of the performance of the United States Armed Forces emphasized that a very large percentage, perhaps a majority, of American combat troops in the Second World War never fired their weapons. Never. And this became a matter of great concern, and I know that because this is we were taught about this in, <laughs> when I was a young military officer, is uh, you had to uh, take actions, you know, through training, through psychological uh, uh, action, activity, uh, to overcome this inhibition of people to fire their weapons. And uh, so the, this uh, was boasted about and during the Vietnam War of how effective this had been because now, you know, people, you know, if it moves, shoot it, you know, or <laughs> it did this in a way they hadn't done before. And so, again, this, uh, um, you know, helps, I think, to explain or at least to uh, uh, maintain the discussion about uh, these uh, uh, actions which we're considering here as violations of the laws of war undertaken by United States military forces, whether they be drone attacks, whether they be helicopter airstrikes as uh, Snowden's uh, documents uh, or tapes revealed, you know, you have uh, an, an eagerness to pull that trigger and to kill uh, that was, if these uh, World War II studies and reports are accurate, uh, did not exist in the uh, overall, uh, you know, psyche of uh, American armed forces. Now you have, again though, you were dealing previously with, uh, you know, people who were largely draftees and were not, did not identify themselves as military. They were, you know, GIs just waiting to go home, you know, get home as fast as they could. And now you have a, uh, a highly professionalized and highly indoctrinated war-making group, and one could argue that the, uh, if it's a, a point worth discussion in the context of what you're doing, is this extraordinary rate of suicides, PTSD, so forth, which is occurring in, uh, among uh, veterans of, this, uh, of these conflicts in Afghanistan and Iraq means that the underlying reluctance to engage in these activities, no matter how uh, eagerly or willingly uh, one participates in them as a result of training slash indoctrination, whatever, uh, you know, is, is still there. And I think that this uh, is underlies in an important way the types of laws of war that we have. Just two final questions. Uh, I'll make it two-part. Uh, so with what you know and what you can see going on in the world today, any thoughts that were 
still following some of these policies that you've described in the Mideast, either to uh, fomenting or supporting some guerrillas, some insurgents that we prefer, or propping up or giving support, the same type of counterinsurgency support as we've given to countries such as Guatemala or El Salvador in the Mideast. And then finally, uh, anything you'd like to say about Sam Adams' associates for integrity and intelligence mm -hmm. and who Sam Adams was? Okay. Well, I'll answer the second one first because Sam Adams is a, an individual, a now deceased former uh, CIA intelligence officer in Vietnam whose name happened to be Sam Adams, no connection with either the beer or the Patriot, uh, <coughs> who was the, I guess, I don't know precisely what his position was, but is an analyst in the uh, CIA station in Saigon, uh, consistently uh, rejected the estimates of uh, uh, Viet Cong, if you will, NLF, uh, you know, the opposition forces, uh, troop strength. Uh, Westmoreland, eager to show in his version of the, <laughs> the Iraq search uh, all those years ago that the, the tactics were working, consistently reported a very low level of uh, troop strength. Uh, for the NLF, for the Fiat Cong forces. Adams uh, report, you know, on the basis of his analysis, was consistently reporting that uh, the actual forces available for the enemy there were at least 50 percent larger. And his reporting was rejected by the command and the lower figures were the ones that were sent to Washington to justify, you know, keeping on, keeping on. And uh, so uh, McGovern knew of him because Ray served as a U.S. Army intelligence officer in the late stages of the Vietnam War. And so uh, uh, Adams, uh, you know, kept within channels. He didn't make a big fuss, but he, you know, raised enough issues within the channels that uh, it effectively destroyed his career. So the Sam Adams Award is uh, one given for integrity in intelligence. He, you know, he did careful and well-balanced analysis without consideration for outside factors and, uh, you know, reported it through channels and paid the price in terms of his career. I will say, uh, one of the, in regard to this, one of the documents that crossed my desk uh, while I was working in the embassy in, uh, in Thailand around this time was uh, a uh, message intercepted from uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the area along the old famous Street Without Joy there, which was the Marine Corps area of operation in uh, Vietnam. And I was interested to see that the reports that I, that you know, came regularly across my desk and I noted them. Uh, every six months or so, the uh, Marine area would report that they had successfully cleaned out and destroyed all of the Viet Cong units there. I think I told you this before, but the, uh, uh, the, the cable I got was, you know, from the leadership group of the NLF in that area. And it effectively endorsed that they'd been wiped off. But it was addressed to the in people in the villages of the, you know, District 1. And it said, uh, and this is a very close paraphrase, your grandfathers and your fathers and your uncles died fighting the French. Your cousins and older brothers, you know, have died fighting the Americans. Now it is your turn to die, come. And they came. That was the point about how intense, you know, this was. 
and uh, you know the fact that people were not you know assigning the you know the real value to this intense cultural nationalist struggle that was going on but you know one would simply rely on body counts you know was uh, something that uh, eventually had to be dealt with and it led to a thing. Now you asked me about one other question. Was it the Mideast? Any similarities? Oh, Anything yeah. to say about this? Oh, goodness gracious. Uh, this uh, whole question of who you select, you know, who were we supporting in the uh, uh, in Afghanistan to get rid of the uh, then you know, Taliban or even the very secular and relatively uh, civilized uh, Soviet-supported uh, government there. Okay, so we, you know, sought out, you know, those who would do this. And, uh, you know, the, the Soviet-supported government that had the, you know, temerity, you know, to grant uh, Significant rights to women, among other things, you know, and it couldn't be tolerated by. So you had, you know, people, the, you know, we call them religious fanatics or the Afghan equivalents of Tea Partiers, whatever you want to call them. But uh, these are people who believe their whole value system was being threatened, severely threatened by this, and uh, working with the United States government which had made its own determination, you know, that it could not tolerate a, uh, uh, let's say, a, a Russian-friendly, Soviet-friendly government in Afghanistan, and which was still stewing over our own, you know, defeat and, if you will, flight from Vietnam. Uh, you, you can read these accounts in popular literature, and there's some basis for it in the documents, a few that I've been able to see. Strong elements to say, you know, the Soviets have to suffer their own Vietnam. This became what is known popularly as Charlie Wilson's War, supported heavily by the uh, Texas congressman, Charles Wilson. And uh, this brought in, we, this, uh, Guess who? Al Qaeda and uh, uh, Osama bin Laden, who came from a very wealthy uh, family of Yemeni origin, but which had uh, uh, ensconced itself in the Saudi Arabian economy with huge construction firms. You know, it was uh, bin Laden who brought in the money and the other support. So you know, he was there. About in uh, in other circumstances, other instances, you put yourself in these positions, and adverse consequences, whether they be uh, physical or moral, uh, frequently occur.